Hey, hello, and welcome to Stan Osterman's show here. Stan, the energy man, coming to you live and direct from lovely Kailua, Hawaii. The background in the picture is actually on the on the leeward side of the island, a place called Point Panic, of all places. It's it's a nice surfing place. Uh, but in the summertime, the waves can get pretty big, and you do panic because boats go running right by you while you're surfing. Anyway. Uh, we're going to continue our discussion with Dan Goen this week. Um, we started off last week, and I just want to kind of recap what we were talking about. Um, Dan gave us a, a, a picture, or you know, painted a picture of the possibilities of how we could be tapping into um, basically uh, abandoned or or finished um, oil wells and and gas wells, and how we could use the um, those facilities to store hydrogen on a large scale. And he gave us a bunch of uh, data like, um, these wells could be used for energy storage under salt domes because the salt deposits are non, non permeable by hydrogen, which is a really small atom. And that's one of the problems of storing hydrogen. It is so small, it's hard to compress and it's hard to store because it can kind of squeeze by just about anything. But we could use this hydrogen in a couple of ways. And one, one of the ways we talked about was taking the residual natural gas that's in those wells, and as we pump hydrogen in there, we could use a hodgepodge of gas that comes out of the well, run it through a gas turbine to make electricity, and then we could even take some of that less pure hydrogens being stored in there and run it through some membranes that would screen out all the impurities except the hydrogen with the right size membrane, and that could be used in fuel cell vehicles or even put back on the grid with stationary fuel cells as another another power source. Um, and then he said that we could use um, that hodgepodge of gas in a gas turbine, um, and it would be about 47% efficient as long as we we're using what we call cogeneration or reason, not only the, the turbine to make electricity, but the steam and the heat to use for other, other sources of uh, power generation. Um, we also talked about some interesting items that we talked about were that fossil fuels are finite. Now, whether you think of, of fossil fuel in terms of climate change, the reality is that we're running out of fossil fuels. The stuff that was easy to get that was high quality is already used up. And we're spending a lot more money to get to a lot more resources that are of less quality. And at some point in the future, we will run out but it's gonna be hard for us to run out of hydrogen because hydrogen is the most plentiful atom in the universe. So we have to kind of look at um, these discussions about hydrogen through that lens of uh, at some point in time, whether you're in a hurry or not, we're gonna run out of fossil fuels. Um, there's three metals, including 316 stainless steel and a couple of plastics that can contain the hydrogen for moving through pipes or moving through tubes or putting in storage vessels. And I hope we can talk a little bit more about that. And something that was news to me is that hydrogen can, becomes a supercritical fluid at 187 PSI, which is relatively low pressure, um, considering, considering that low pressure in the cars is 350 bar and 187 is a 20 bar or something like that. It's, it's really low compared to even the low pressure that we put in cars nowadays. Um, we also talked about something that I think is really important, and that's that wind power um, is currently getting very, very efficient and very, very cheap in terms of generating electricity. And if we take that electricity, um, Dan told us that we could, we could actually produce hydrogen for as little as 68 cents per, uh, kilo, per a kilogram of hydrogen. To give you what we call a gallon of gas equivalent number, that would mean gasoline at 35 or 34 cents a gallon. So think about if you had a fuel cell car and you could get your hydrogen for 68 cents a kilogram, you'd actually be getting essentially 34 cents a gallon gasoline for your car. Um, the high end of, uh, of four cents a kilowatt hour for your electricity coming off the wind turbines, which is what I was told, if you just built a purpose-built wind field, um, you could sell the, the electricity for four cents, four cents a kilowatt hour. That would give you a two dollar and sixty cents a kil two dollars sixty cents for a kilogram of hydrogen, which again would be a dollar and thirty dollar thirty cents of gallon of gas equivalent. So <clears throat> even in a 
case we can do right now, you could make, be making the gallon gas equivalent a dollar thirty instead of the three or four dollars that California and Hawaii are looking at right now. Um, we also learned that there's some new technologies to compress hydrogen more efficiently. And I'd really like to learn more about that from uh, Dan because he was talking pressures up in the tens of thousands of pounds per square inch. So, so Dan, I, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but that's kind of a recap from, from last week. And uh, we're going to kind of roll into um, a, a more of the discussion, but if there's something you want to recap from last week as well, well, I, I mean, when we talked about the, the metals you were talking about, they're actually metal alloy families, entire families that are impervious to hydrogen metals. Okay. Metal, you know, family metals, that, yeah, that's right. So, so it's not just three alloys, there's a lot of metals that are actually compatible with hydrogen. And then when you combine it with some of the uh, plastics that are impervious with it too, that, that'll be a game changer. So I, I can imagine when we sit down and do the, uh, the compression show, we we'll probably have a lot of executives running these pipe companies and stuff. Probably going to watch that show because that'll probably be a money maker for a lot of people. So if I can get them to put slide number two up, okay. Okay. So what we're talking about there, slide number two, uh, that would be a system that centerpiece here with the electrolyzers, the gas wells, and the gas turbine and the compressors. Uh, that right there is what we would put down at, at the community level. What you would do is you would probably have this at the county level or something like this. Now, it's not hundreds of millions of dollars, but it is in the millions of dollars. So it would be something that you would distribute at the county level. But that that facility there, you could expand it or contract it. But that, that facility would produce enough gas that you could provide uh, fuel for a number of fuel stations and Whenever you guys need it, whenever you need to produce electricity and you've been islanded off the power grid, you've got you know power there. Now, so when you're talking about the facility there, uh, you're talking about about probably about $20 million, but half the cost is actually going to be that gas turbine because an LM6000, those are usually about $10 million a piece. Okay. So let's go to page number three, and I'll talk a little bit about the cost there. So. That's from next year. We had a little bit of talk about that, but the big part that I wanted to talk about two things. One was I already knew it was outdated because well, here in the Midwestern part of the United States, our average cost of electricity is about $18 a megawatt hour. Now there's a thing on there called a storage adder. Okay, if you look real closely at that page, you'll see it. What that is, is what we call, in the business we call it the battery kicker, okay? And it's usually between five and ten dollars. And what that is is that's when the wind's not blowing, they make up the power for someplace else. So I chip in a little bit of money. The next era, they find power from from a solar or a gas turbine or nuclear, wherever you get the power to, to make up that. Now, I can opt to go without that adder to say, okay, when the wind's not blowing, shut my electrolyzer up. It just so happens I'm running electrolyzer, and that's one of the devices. You can turn it on like a like a light switch. Turn it on, turn it off, and it doesn't really matter because you turn it on, I produce gas. You turn it off, I don't produce gas. Uh, what triggers your compressor or the compressor system is the pressure from the electrolyzer. So, so the point is, I've got infrastructure that can be dynamically turned on and off. That's what we call dynamic load. Okay, in the business. So, if you want to know what some of the one of the things that the the guys at the ISO, the independent system operator that runs the power grid, that they would love to have is dynamic load, load they can turn on. When there's a lot of load in the system, everybody's using the air conditioner, hey, turn that dynamic load off. It helps them out a lot balancing the grid. So they would kind of they would kind of like us to make hydrogen, be quite honest, to help them out. Um, okay, can I get, to, let's see, page number four, please. Okay. Okay, so where did this idea come from? Notice I got here, transport electrons, not fuel. So. On that picture uh, down there, you'll see this square down there, the sort of like down there in yellow. Uh, there's a power plant down in Southern India called Petersburg, the Petersburg Power Plant. They originally built that in 67. They've been adding generating units all the way up to 1986. But basically what they did is they built a power plant on top of a coal mine because the utility company, Indianapolis Power and Light, decided that it was cheaper to transport electrons and not coal, okay? now. So all those red dots you see, those those coal-fired power plants, some of those orange dots, 
those are the power plants we've converted over to gas turbines. So unfortunately, you know, the coal is running out and I know that sooner or later that Petersburg power plant is gonna be turned over to natural gas. And I'm gonna lead that into the next one we've got right here. I kind of go to page number five here. Okay, so that's the gas field down in southern Indiana, down around between Evansville and Petersburg. That's the latest data. I pulled that out Monday. Now that picture has the red, those are actually oil wells. There's actually pumper jacks pumping oil out of the ground. There's not many of them. There aren't many depleted wells out there. A lot of those wells, if you look at that underlying thing right there, this is gas storage. We store a lot of gas down in Southern Indiana, down in that area. We pump that gas up from Texas. Okay, now I'm gonna talk, the next slide I'm gonna talk about a situation and it's leading up to what's going on right now. It's causing uh, prices to be unstable in the gas market throughout the United States, right? You might be hearing about that, especially in the next couple of months. So we can we go to page number six, please? Okay, so that's the gas grid throughout the United States with all those pumping stations. Remember we talked about that first meeting we did and I said we're consuming 30% of the gas in that pipeline, just powering the pump stations, okay? Yeah, so, yeah. so in the past, what we would do is we would pump gas from Texas all the way up here. And we'd store up, up up here in our gas field up here. And that way, when the hurricanes hit in the fall down in Texas and it takes out all the infrastructure, we would actually pump gas back down there to keep everybody supplied with natural gas. But this year, what happened is we had some freak storms in the springtime and it took out the infrastructure down in Texas. So we haven't stored enough gas up here. And right now we've had a hurricane go through and it took a lot of the infrastructure down, uh, down in Texas and down in Louisiana offline. So this, this winter, we're gonna lead, go into a gas shortage. Now, that's gonna turn into an interesting uh, opportunity for hydrogen and it's gonna cause what we call price parity. Well, let me explain how this is work. What we're talking about is a BTU to BTU comparison between natural gas and hydrogen. I, would, I thought I'd never see this, but that's what's happening. So what happens is whenever natural gas between five and $10 per million BTUs, that's comparable to hydrogen that's being produced uh, by electricity work We've, we're purchasing electricity at the power grid between $10 a megawatt hour and $20 a megawatt hour. And, you know, so understand that one pound of hydrogen is equal to two and a half pounds of natural gas. So we're getting a BTU to BTU comparison and that, that's where the price is actually lining up. So whenever the price of electricity wholesale on power grid is under $20 a megawatt hour, and whenever the price of natural gas is greater than $5 per million BTUs, we get to a point where it's more economical to, to make hydrogen and store it in the ground than it is to mess with that natural gas. And what's been happening the last couple of years is because the weather's becoming more and more unstable, we're also getting a situation down in the Gulf where we're not seeing as much drilling for oil and hence gas down in the Gulf. And if the reason why has to do with the, the fact that as we go deeper and deeper out into the water there in the Gulf and the costs go up because you're going farther and farther out, the water's going deeper and deeper, believe it or not, uh, Lloyd's of London and all these big, the insurance companies that insure those, those drill rigs, they, they, they don't want to insure them, right? So you're seeing the insurance uh, actually die and that's actually starting to kill off drilling. So now the Gulf states usually would die between one to two million barrels of oil a day. And of course there's gas associated with it, but because we, uh, because the insurance companies won't cover the rigs, we're gonna see that production start to shrink. And like I said, it's usually between one, and million, one million barrels to two million barrels a day. So we're actually gonna start getting a lot less gas from down in the Texas area. Now that doesn't include all the shale that they're drilling down there. So that's gonna, we're gonna see that more and more often. So. So economically, we're going to be driven into doing something else, uh, and and the hydrogen is the most logical thing we can do. Yeah, let me let me just point out there too that, you know, when you made that point to point comparison between natural gas and hydrogen, you were talking electrolysis, which is we call green hydrogen or the most expensive way of making hydrogen, 
as opposed to steam reforming. Yep. And you're saying the most expensive way of making hydrogen could potentially be on par with natural gas. That's yep. like a mind blower. That's going to be a game changer for a, a lot of people when they really start to understand hydrogen. Yeah, and what why that's happening is that, that well, we talked about last time about these electrolysizers that we pack into a 40-foot cargo container. 40-foot cargo container, you know, big box, one megawatt of power, 22 kilograms per megawatt. You know, simple idea, simple concept, but that's a nominal yield. Some of the more advanced electrolysizers, some of the stuff coming in the Department of Energy, some of that stuff in theory should produce something close to 45 kilograms per megawatt hour, but we'll see. But right now, the stuff I can go buy right now produces 22 kilograms for a million watts of electricity. And when I can buy electricity for less than $20 for a megawatt hour, you, know, you can see where hydrogen, green hydrogen, electrolysis hydrogen starts to sink. And you're going to have a hard time making, you know, in the, the only reason why we even had steam reforming and why that even exists or that form of hydrogen, because it's being made at a at an oil refinery, what they're using, they're using what are called flare gases. And flare gases are gases, they just, it's, it's a byproduct of refining oil. It's gas they were going to burn up and throw away. So it was throwaway gas. And that's the reason why it was so cheap, because it was something they're throwing away from their fire. But if you're not refining as much gasoline, or if the crude oil that you've got is so expensive to refine into gasoline, and it causes the prices to go up, that means people aren't going to buy the fuel. The point is that that source of hydrogen is going to go away. And if that goes away and then we're having problems with the coal, you're not going to see that source of hydrogen because that's another way of making hydrogen is from coal. So you're not going to be able to make hydrogen from that just because you won't have the material to make it with. So what you're going to be left with is green hydrogen. That's from the electrolysis. And, and it has to do with we had this old way of making hydrogen and still there, but the costs are going up because the fuel is being depleted. And the electrolysizers just got down to the point where, like I said, we're packing into a 40 foot cargo container. And that's yeah. the perfect format for hydrogen and electrolysis. So the parallel to that too is, as we draw down in fossil fuel use, we also lose those formerly cheap ways of making hydrogen. Yeah, 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 they all okay. disappear, yeah. All right. Yeah. Can we go to, uh, was it page number seven, please? Okay, so that map right there, that's from the Department of Energy, okay, and it's been out for, for quite a while, but that is a map, it's the United States, so those are places where we're currently storing hydrogen underground, places where we, we stored hydrogen in the past, places where we know we can convert over to hydrogen storage, and there are two different ways we can make synthetic hydrogen repositories. Uh, the light blue areas you see right there, those are salt deposits, so there's a salt deposit or at, down around the Tampa Bay area that I would love to turn into a giant hydrogen repository. Drill down underneath that salt, frack the rock underneath that salt and build a giant hydrogen repository right at the tip of the, the state of Florida, okay? So there's a lot of opportunity there. The other one is uh, there's sedimentary uh, rocks. Uh, there's a type of rock called dolomite, which is a very dense form of limestone. And what happens is when that limestone is saturated with rock salt, it, it's one of those materials that's impervious to hydrogen. Now you can drill down 10,000 feet horizontally, drill the rock, frack it, make a hydrogen repository. It's not as robust as the salt. So it kind of depends on what areas we try it be, because there might be some areas we can make this work and other areas where, where we can't. But the areas where I know we can make work are those blue areas, and that's where the salt is. So that's a huge, huge possibility we could. Now, if you're horizontally drilling and fracking, understand the total cost. You're probably talking about ten dollars, ten million dollars per well. So it's not cheap. The good news about that process: once you drill it, it'll always be there. Okay, but if you drill one in one of those sedimentary areas and it doesn't work out, that might be a ten million dollar loss. So there's a risk there with trying trying to make make something like this work. Okay, so page number eight, please. Page number eight, there we go. Okay, so what's in that there, uh, that's the northern part of Indiana. Um, down there you see a box down there, it's like yellow with a red box, okay, around it. That's a town called Fowler, Indiana. That is a wind farm town, literally. 
you're driving the town, it's surrounded by wind turbines. Okay. So the northern part of Indiana from about there going north, that is wind power country. Okay. So from there and all around the Great Lakes, you're going to see a lot of wind. Okay. Now, one of the truths about Indiana, and it's true here, and it's similar for a lot of other states, but here in Indiana, we curtail seven terawatts of wind every year. That curtailment means we throw away. We don't use, the wind's blowing, but we have no use for the power. To, to get an idea about how much hydrogen we're talking about, that's 154 million kilograms of hydrogen we could be storing today, right? Uh, if you were refueling Toyota Mirai cars, you could refill your car 25 million times, okay? And if you refill your car, let's say once a week, we could support 493,000 cars on something we're throwing away. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's I mean, the state of EVM. So. And, and that's really the point we try and make to a lot of the uh, electric utilities that are starting to get intermittent renewables. They start to saturate out at about like 18 to 20% intermittence because of stability issues on the grid. And what the point you made earlier, the electrolyzer can be turned off and turned on and turned off and turned on it's it can be a load or it can be shut off and you know it, it's it's like you put those two together you got curtailed power from utilities that's being wasted and so you turn your electrolyzers on and they make hydrogen and store all the hydrogen for later in the day or at night and or down the road and the prices you're like it's efficient you're you're using that curtailed power to make all this hydrogen, which has a value to it that we're not doing right now. Yeah, and here's the, the plus, the benefit here. So, so, and I've said this before to everybody. So I'm the guy that designed the system here at Mid Midcott and ISO, designed the computer system. And so we, the, the ISO, we have our own intranet. And so I know how to interface that, those electrolysizers into that computer system. I can't say that about other ISOs, but I know myself, I know exactly how to, uh, build the interface on those electrolysizers directly into the computer system up there at MISO. So you could do this in real time at the speed of light because uh, here at MISO, the, uh, we use a, a dark fiber intranet to control all the different systems. So, so, it, so, so it's not just doable, it can be done in real time. In fact, I can tell you, we have load out there that we dynamically control right now. Um, yeah, right. So, for example, there are certain manufacturers that we turn on and off dynamically when we have to curtail power. Uh, certain places that do like roll steel and places like that, we dynamically turn the power. Uh, concrete, any place that makes concrete, we dynamically turn that power off when we've got too much load on the grid and we have to dynamically. So, it, we're, I'm not doing, we're not doing anything we're not doing already is what I'm getting. Uh, if I can go to page number nine, please. Yeah, even even Hawaiian Electric, they have a they designed a thing called the smart grid. And what it really does is it allows the electric company to turn off each individual residential inverter. It's like, well, if you can turn off, you know, a couple thousand individual residential inverters, you can certainly turn off a couple electrolyzers. You know, it'd be a whole lot easier to program that into your system. So okay. yeah. So if we can go to slide number nine, please. Okay, and that's that's the last slide I've got. And that's just wind power throughout the United States. Uh, the state of Texas, you were talking, we were talking about Texas. The state of Texas, according to my, my friends down at ERCOT, the state of Texas curtails 17 terawatts of wind every year. 17 terawatts. That's a huge amount of wind. And you know, and we're and the only place we really haven't got really good, I don't, I don't know why, maybe the guys at Next Era could tell you they're the, the, the southern part of the United States. You know, Louisiana all the way to Florida for whatever reason we don't have good penetration with wind, but uh, but I I think we've got some other opportunities for the Florida coast anyway. But uh, but you can see look at that. I mean, we've got a, quite a bit of wind throughout the United States, and uh, there's a report that I have from the Department of Energy that simply states between Texas and the border with Canada up there, there's a 300 terawatt wind corridor, right? Now, if we understand, we're talking about Kansas, Oklahoma, Nebraska, North and South Dakota, right? Uh, and it, it, that's wind country anyway. But as far as the rest of the country trying to take advantage of it, we probably only need to upgrade the grid by about 30% just to take advantage of that wind quarter. So, yeah. 
so this it, it isn't going to take as much of an effort what everybody thinks is what I'm getting at. And upgrading the power grid by 30% over a 10-year period of time, that's really nothing considering the Herculean effort we did in building the current power grid. So well, a, this, this kind of gets us to the point where you know I wanted to go with the uh, last show and this one together, and that is we don't need to keep the traditional grid design that we have right now, which is basically taking a relatively few number of generation sources and pushing it out, we could actually have a lot of smaller size generation and storage and dispatchable power, uh, you know, systems, i.e. microgrids in like rural areas or residential areas that don't have a huge power fluctuation like industrial areas. And we could more efficiently um, use power in those areas because we're not pushing that electricity through long power lines um, at high voltages and stuff. So um, I have a quote, uh, you know, I used to have to do Covey stuff. You know, if you're a business guy, we had, we're always at gunpoint held to uh, do Covey uh, studies. And his one point though was transportation of a product uh, is non-value added to the process. In other words, if you have to move it, it costs you money that doesn't really add any value to your product. It's just getting it places. And then you came up the last time we talked and said, if you're going to move something, move the electrons. And that makes sense to me because electrons don't weigh a whole lot. They don't, they don't take up a whole lot of space. You know, it's easy to push them through a wire or to, to push them through a pipeline if it's uh, hydrogen and you're using basically the electrons. But can you expand a little bit on, on that concept? I mean, the idea is simple. I mean, electrons weigh nothing and hydrogen is a close second. So so what you want to do is you could purchase, you, look, you could purchase the power across the power grid using that energy system in the markets and, the, and purchase the power. And if we've got wind or solar or, or whatever it is that we've got out there producing power, geothermal, may, maybe nuclear power, I, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe we'll get fusion working, who knows? But the point is, is when there's power out there available, you you purchase it inexpensively. And there's times here when you can do that and you turn that into hydrogen and you store it locally. So you purchase it across the grid, you produce it, store it, and consume it locally and not and, and try to reduce your transportation of it. I, one of the things that I kind of cringe at when I look at California, even Hawaii, about the you know the the truck you guys got, your your putting hydrogen in these big cylinders or a big tank, whatever, and you're hauling that thing around. I'm like, well, you're losing so much, uh, how much energy and cost that's just sunk, just you're trying to transport or compress gas when all you have, all you really need is that power grid and 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 just move the electrons rather than, you know, didn't mess with that truck trying to ship around that stuff. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the things killing the fossil fuel business, all that cost of transportation. Yeah, and it's a two-edged sword though. And, and my point would be, we should be making that electricity locally and making the hydrogen locally and not having to truck it around versus even putting up power lines, which for us, we have a hurricane about every five, 10 years, and it wipes out a whole bunch of power lines that take a week or so to get back online. And that means people go without power and, and refrigeration and ice and hospitals get stuck and water pumping stops. So the idea is, if we could make the use renewables and make hydrogen when we could with uh, curtailed power and or use real efficient um, uh, geothermal like in Hawaii uh, to make the hydrogen, we could be doing really well if we would redesign our grids to accommodate traditional grid structure for for urban areas and industrial areas. And then for rural areas, maybe do more dispatchable power and microgrids. So. I, I know one of the things I talked with you about in Hawaii, uh, for Hawaii, I'm not really a big fan of things like wind power for Hawaii, because like I said, I'm you got either. the real estate challenge. But I think one of the better ideas out there is sea turbines. So it's just underwater turbines, not the ones that take advantage of waves, but these are turbines that you sink like 100 or 200 meters underneath the water and take advantage of those deep ocean currents, which you've got around the, the, the Hawaiian Islands. And, and the concept's really simple. You just take a wind turbine, you chop it down, you and you anchor it down to the bottom, the bottom of the ocean. And it takes advantage of those deep sea currents. And 
that whole technology, I think, is just a, a, it's going to be an incredible thing. And for Hawaii, I mean, I've, the latest reports I've got, you guys could be reducing about 80 terawatts of, of sea turbine power, 80 terawatts. I don't think you guys will ever use that much power. I don't think yeah. you, that's a huge amount of power that's just right there, right, looking right out there at that water. That's right there available to you. And all you just need to do is, you know, put a sea turbine out there and grab a hold of it. Okay, well, let's plan on doing that show in a couple of weeks and we'll uh, we'll have you back on and we'll talk about that. And we're going to have you back on a couple of times because we've dug up a few other really good things that you happen to have expertise on that uh, we can really explore more. So that's going to do it for Stan the Energy Man today and we'll see everybody next week. And thanks to Dan Gowen again for uh, spending some time with us. Aloha.